Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so delighted to introduce this virtual event with Sherry Turkle presenting her new book, The Empathy Diaries, a memoir in conversation with Rana Faruhar. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and to our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we host events here on our Zoom account. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com and you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we will get through as many questions as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase copies of the Empathy Diaries on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. We thank you so much for showing up and for tuning in in support not only of our authors, but also of the truly fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. And we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. And now I am pleased to introduce our speakers. Sherry Turkle is the Abby Rockefeller Mose Professor of the Social Studies of Science and Technology at MIT and the founding director of the MIT Initiative on Technology and Self. A licensed clinical psychologist, she is the author of six books, including Alone Together and the New York Times bestseller, Reclaiming Conversation. She is a recipient of Guggenheim and Rockefeller Humanities Fellowships, and she is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Rana Faruhar is global business columnist and an associate editor at the Financial Times. She is also CNN's global economic analyst. Her first book, Makers and Takers, The Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business, was shortlisted for the Financial Times McKinsey Book of the Year Award in 2016. Her second book, Don't Be Evil, How Big Tech Betrayed Its Founding Principles and All of Us, was named Porchlight Business Book of the Year. Tonight, they'll be discussing Sherry Turkle's new memoir, The Empathy Diaries, which is at once an intellectual history and an emotional excavation of her life and career. She traces her fraught upbringing in post-war Brooklyn, her education in the intellectual hotbeds of Radcliffe and Paris in the late 60s, and her battle for professional recognition at MIT. Dwight Garner praises in his review for the New York Times, The Empathy Diaries is a beautiful book. It has gravity and grace. It's as inexorable as a fable. It drills down into the things that make a life. It works to make sense of existence on both its coded and transparent levels. It feels like an instant classic of the genre. I am honored to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Sherry and Rana. Thanks so much, Nell. And thank you, Sherry, for inviting me to do this event with you. You are a rock star. Um, I'm jealous because uh, we've done a lunch with the FT, which is gonna be out in a couple of weeks, but Dwight scooped me uh, in saying how great this book was. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just invite you to do a couple of minutes um, reading the first page because I think it really sets the, the stage in a way that, that I can't. So why don't you take it away and then we'll jump in with questions. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say before I begin just how thrilled I am to be here. This is my home bookstore. Uh, many of the events that I describe in the book happened inches from Harvard Bookstore. Um, and uh, I'm so thrilled that Rana is uh, 
going to be chatting with me because she's just the perfect, uh, she's just the perfect person. So thank you. And thank all of you who are here. This is how my book begins. During the long hours of my grandmother's dying, I begin to read the Brooklyn telephone book. I look up the Charles Zimmermans. There are pages of them. I study the entries carefully. It's August, 1975, I'm 27. For as long as I can remember, I've been both searching and not searching for Charles Zimmerman, my father, whom I haven't seen since childhood. Now I'm searching. In the back of one of my graduate school notebooks, I begin to copy down Charles Zimmerman addresses and telephone numbers, long lists of them. My mother is dead and my grandparents with whom I stay when I'm in New York have only the Brooklyn telephone book, no Manhattan directory. I know that in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one of my Harvard professors has the Manhattan directory in his office. He once commented that everyone needs to have that directory at hand. At the time, this idea suggested a life of access and sophistication that thrilled me. Now though, I feel a more practical need. When I get back to school, I ask his secretary if I may borrow his Manhattan book. She says no, but she lets me sit with it in his office where I carefully copy out new Zimmerman candidates. My grandmother dies in December at LaGuardia Airport flying back to Boston after her funeral. My plane is delayed. Standing next to a payphone, I study the Queen's directory and copy down the information for all its Charles Zimmermans. It never occurs to me that my father might live in the Bronx or have moved out of New York City altogether. Both during my mother's life and long afterward, I had respected my mother's wish to keep secret what she considered the great shame of her early divorce. I never spoke of my biological father. More than this, from the time I was five and my mother remarried, this was to Milton Turkle, my family lived under a regime of pretend. The rules were that although my legal name was Sherry Zimmerman, I had to say that my name was Sherry Turkle. I met with a private investigator, a former police detective. I no longer remember his name, just his thin black hair and shiny gray suit. In the spring of 1979, I visited his small bare office on the west side, furnished with only a well-used lamp, a coat tree, and a steel desk. After Thanksgiving, the detective calls. He says that he thinks he's found my Charles Zimmerman. I remember that as we spoke, I could only take shallow breaths. I was crossing a line. My mother had not wanted me to do this. Perhaps she'd had her reasons. Whew. Um, you know, this book is so many things. It, it is the Empathy Diaries. It is a mystery, which you set up beautifully. And unlike many memoirs, you don't really come fully back to until the very end. Although I have to say that that didn't, that didn't bother me. Um, but I want to pull the lens before we, we dig into the details. I want to pull the lens way back and just say, I'm sure everyone on this call knows that you're famous for studying how people relate to technology. It's a pretty big leap to go from being an academic at MIT, uh, even a rock star one who's been on the cover of Ms. Magazine um, and, and is famous in the mass, mass population to doing a memoir. I mean, memoirs are risky, you know, that you're, you're, you're going out on a huge limb, um, but I see the connection between empathy because your work is about how people relate to technology. Uh, this is really about how you relate to your family and in particular, your mother. So can you talk a little bit about that, that invisible line and, and how you thought about it as you came to this project? Yeah. Um, in the I... 
I would say that because my family had me live with a secret, I knew that there was an official story and the real story. Mm. And I became sort of the Nancy Drew, <laughs> the detective of my own life, mm. to try to figure out why were people doing that? Mm. And if we were living this lie, well, other people might be living lies too. Mm. And what was, what was the story behind their stories? Mm. And so the way I put it in the book is that before empathy for me was a virtue, mm. a kind of emotional virtue, it was a, uh, it was a, a, a way to survive. It was a survival tactic mm. because I didn't want to be caught in this miasma of there's no truth. You lie, you make up a story, you're, you, you, have, you hide your name, you don't answer to your name. I, I needed to be grounded, mm. but I needed to understand what could have been motivating the people around me who otherwise seemed so sane and who loved me and who were my rocks, you know, who were my family. You're, but I developed a kind of, um, you know, skill at learning how to read people to understand what was really going on, because I knew that there must be secrets everywhere because I was a secret. Mm. I was the proof that everywhere mm. there were secrets. I was living the secret. You know, so it, 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 from the earliest years, I understood the power of, of, of listening and of understanding people's motivations and learning to have compassion for why people would do what on the surface seemed such odd things. And that sort of became my life's that became a kind of life narrative for me. You know, it's interesting because um, object relations are really important in your academic work and in the study of, um, of empathy in general. I mean, you know, when you think about what is technology, computers, not just a computer to a child, what is it? There's so much of that that you're drawing a line to in your own book. And I remember a particular incident in which your mother, who was a just a fascinating character. Um, I mean, both incredibly loving and yet also having a rather loose relationship with the truth for a variety of reasons. Um, she well, she uh, had her own truth. She had the truth of her love. Well, exactly. And there's a, there's a wonderful place in the book where your mother has a secret, a big secret, which you are sort of aware of and yet not aware of. You find out, you've come to grips with later her illness. And she is holding this back and there's a moment in which she knows that this is happening and that she's sick. She doesn't share this with you, but she goes out to the store and she buys you a cap, a hat, and tells you that it's homemade. And it's fascinating because it's both true and not true, it seems. Well, what's wonderful about that moment, I mean, the, the, I, I just want to make the link just to what, what I was saying before, is that the, 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 the connection between that interest in empathy and the technology bit mm -hmm. is that when I saw technology undermining our capacity for empathy, I became lit. My work became, I, I, in the book, I describe it as lit from within. Mm when I saw that technology by defocusing our attention could undermine our capacity for empathy, could undermine our capacity for solitude where I argue empathy is born. Mm -hmm. So that's the connection I make between this interest in empathy and technology. Yeah. But the story you tell about my mother and that story of the, the, of the, of the white cap is so interesting because I didn't, as I tell it in the book, I'm confounded, totally puzzled by, by why my mother is lying to me. Mm. And in the book, 
And in writing it, I didn't understand why she is lying to me. Mm. And I interpreted in the book as she was expressed, she, she gives me a cap. I know she bought it at Lampston's next to the Church Avenue the subway <laughs> station. She says, I've, I've made this for you. And I understand in some primitive way that she's expressing the truth of her love, mm. that she's expressing the truth of some wanting to be more the mother than she is. Mm. And even as a, I, I just understand that as a child, mm. but I'm still angry at her mm. that she needs to lie to me. And it wasn't until, and this is why I recommend memoir writing to, to all. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone has Not everyone. a story or can tell it, but you, okay, go ahead. You, but I mean, as an exercise in, in learning about your life and, and it wasn't until, I mean, this, and I, this is from someone who has been psycho, I mean, this is from someone well psychoanalyzed, that I had the timeline of these, all of these events, her illness, she had, she had breast cancer, her illness when she found out about it, that she knew she was going to hide it from me, the dates, the story of this cap, that I realized that she had lied to me about the cap at the time she discovered that she had breast cancer, knew she would never tell me because it was her dream that I should go away to Radcliffe the way I dreamed I would. And she was not going to tell me because she knew that I wouldn't do that. Mm. I would stay home with her if I knew she was sick. Mm. So she kept her illness from me because she knew that I would you know, go away to a day school in New York. I mean, there were good options to go to school in New York in order not to leave her when she was ill. And I didn't realize this until the book literally was in a stage they call blues when you can't touch, yeah. it. you can just fix typos. And then all of a sudden it leapt out at me that she had come home, she had come home from the doctor. She knew she was ill. She knew she could never share this with me. She wanted to give me something, have a moment with me. And she bought this hat and said she had made it. She was giving me this gift. Mm -hmm. And even just now, I just choke up that, that this connection. And I, I didn't see that until after I had written the book and I had these timelines and these connections. And there were many examples like that of that the discipline of writing this book brought me those moments. So there, it was really a very exciting experience. Well, I have to say there were, there were a couple places where I choked up, you know, with referred guilt of the daughter, you know, reading, you were so precise about what was happening between you and your mother emotionally. And there was this moment, you mentioned Radcliffe, that, that really got me where you came out and on the page basically admitted to something. I'm not sure I've ever read a more sort of intimate admission of of purposely shaming your mother in, yeah. a, in a crucial moment. And I just, I could barely breathe. And I wonder what, what that was like for you to write. Maybe you wanna share that story. Well, the story was, is that basically my mother, from my point of view, uh, took my father away. She'd been married as a young woman. She had me as a child. And when, we, when I was one year old, we left and I was never to say his name, speak of him, talk of him. Literally, that was it. And there's, there are, there are, even on the cover of the book, there's a, once I was allowed to see him on the cover of the book, shows the different evocative objects of my life. There's my grandmother's dishes, there's the Nancy Drew mystery stories, there's a letter my mother wrote. And here, very mysteriously, there's the one time I saw my father as a child, he took me on a rowboat ride in, 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 in Prospect Park, which mm -hmm. made an enormous 
effect on me. But basically she took him away from me. Yeah. There were these, this one visit that made such an impression, but she took him away from me and we couldn't speak of it. Mm-hmm. It was totally taboo. And I was so angry at her. On the other hand, she was all I had. Mm-hmm. So there was this undercurrent of, of rage and love, yeah. which is the background for this story that I get into Radcliffe we go for the, I did before I get into Radcliffe, we go for the admissions interview and we go together. And this is our moment of her wanting to participate. And now I know it, the sacrifice that she made of not, you know, of not speaking to me of not sharing her illness with me so that I would do this. She only wanted to participate in this moment of hope and aspiration. Mm. And as we are, As we're going into the interview with Dean Elliott, only a few blocks from Harvard Bookstore on Fay Street, at Fay House. Um, As we're going in, I see the glint of the hair clip that used to kind of anchor her bouffant, this giant bouffant used to come up and then out and then you know, I have a little bit of a flip, but she re- I mean, she really was like, a, I mean, she was like, it was really like a 1960s madman helmet. Yeah. She used to spray it and then clip it and then have, and I mean, it was a, it was amazing. And it had, there's a, there were pictures of her in the book that are just extraordinary. And as we're going into the interview, I see this silver clip that she's used to kind of keep that, to keep that little flip. And when I, you know, I got into Radcliffe, whatever the interview, it it works. But as we are walking back to the Sheraton commander, I say to her, I was so embarrassed you had a clip in your hair. And I could feel her, that I had exposed us for who we were. Uh as uh-huh. not deserving to be there. I had, I had, it was the most cruel thing I could have done, you know, that we were not worthy of being there, that we were these Brooklyn people with hair clips and spray and who had gone into this interview with these care. And I couldn't believe this was coming out of my, I mean, I couldn't, I mean, it was on the border of intention and, it was not on, it was not the unconscious speaking. I mean, I, mm. and, but I realized how angry I, it was expression of this rage mm. in a moment of, of really her, her, her only wanting to be participant in this joy. And I say in the book, and I included it because I, I wanted to show that if you're not allowed to speak about something as important as this, no matter how much love and connection and, and empathy and caring, it will, it will show. It will, and I, but I say in the book that if I could have one do-over in life, this would be my do-over. Uh, you picked a good one. I have to say, I called my mother after reading that part of your <laughs> book, just total guilt, total, <laughs> so, so much understanding. Uh, the immigrant family, the aspiration, the pride, you know, and I love that that's your do-over because there's a lot in that book that's pretty intimate. I mean, you talk about your marriage, you talk about, um, you're very frank about um, being denied tenure at first, um, although, you know, (laughs) frankly, that, that part was kind of amazing to me. And this is, this is a part of the academic world that I I still have a hard time as a kind of a, you know, a popular writer and journalist understanding this. There seems to be some weird, um, we want you to be popular, but not too popular. And we want you to stay within a tribe. And there's an insider outsider quality to your work, which is of course the power of it. And you describe all these things. Um, and- I remember, I remember, um... I was so happy uh, uh, when The Second Self, which was my first book on the computer culture, was uh, bought by Simon & Schuster, a very large pop, pop, you know, trade. Yeah. yeah. 
And because my grandparents uh, were really struggling financially mm. and I really used to help them with that money. And uh, I was so happy and, and, and they used some of the money to pay bills and um, some of the money, a very small amount of the money, I bought them a television, a color television set. Mm. And in the middle of paying their bills and buying them a television set with the money from that Simon and Schuster had given me, uh, Thomas Kuhn called me, who was a very famous, uh, great historian of science, philosopher of science. And he was at MIT at the time, and he wasn't in my department, but he was certainly had a lot to do with my tenure case. And, and of course he knew that it was in trouble because uh, I think I wasn't in scientific and I wasn't, I was a critic and I think he meant well. Mm. And, was trying, and he said, do not publish your book with Simon and Schuster. Hmm. That is a giant mistake. <laughs> and I've just spent, I mean, the, the money was spent. I mean, <laughs> you know, the color television, the, the television was there. The bills had been paid. There were hospital bills and there were medical bills. And, I'm, and I'm, I remember I stood in my living room holding the phone. This is when, you know, we had like a, a long line, a cold coil, you know, and the coil started in the kitchen. And I was like, and I was like so dizzy that I would like, you know, kind of made it over to the couch with this coil. And, and I sat down because I felt, I really felt quite dizzy because to me, Thomas Kuhn, it was like God, yeah. God was like reaching down and telling me that what I was doing. I said, and I, I did not call him Tom. I, I, mean, I, I called him Professor Kuhn, although theoretically we were colleagues. I said, Professor Kuhn, whoa, whoa, I, they're not changing a word. I mean, you know, I gave them the manuscript as I had written it. So those, those of you who still read The Second Self, it's still in print. There's a beautiful edition of The Second Self. Um, it, it really... Simon and Schuster is now an MIT, it's been reprinted by MIT Press. Uh, um, they didn't change, it. Simon and Schuster did not change a word. I mean, they, they, it, it, anything, that's, anything that's popular about that book was for me. <laughs> um, I said, they haven't changed a word. He says, it doesn't matter. Do not do this. It, you know, he basically saying you're out of the tribe. Yeah. And I, and I just said, I said, it's too late. I, I, yeah, I yeah. Says, and he said, but, but he did not let it go. He said, how can I convince you? And I, I said, I, 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 I have to, I have to go. I, you know, I was so upset. And I think, you know, I think you're onto something there. I mean, it's, it, it, it um, um, but I felt very strongly that what I had and now I sound defensive. <laughs> I mean, I felt very strongly at the time and now, and now I'm joking and I say I sound defensive. I felt very strongly that I, I had discovered something. All the people around me at MIT, at MIT, you see I'm upset, were saying the computer is a tool. It's just a tool. It's yeah. just a tool. The computer is just a tool. And I was finding people for whom the computer was a love affair, an obsession, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was the life changing, it changed how they thought about their mind, it changed, it changed how they thought about their relationships. And I was surrounded by people who were saying it's a waste of time to study this from a psychological point of view. Mm -hmm. It's just a tool. It's amazing. And I thought this culture needs to, you know, it's a very good thing that somebody with no ax to grind, I mean, I, yeah. if the computer was just a tool, like I didn't need to blow the whistle on it. It wasn't like, yeah. <laughs> and I just felt it was very important to, to get that message out. Well, yes. And you were, you know, four decades early. Um, it, it's kind of incredible actually uh, that we're only in a big way having the conversation that you were having now it, it, you know, in the broad population um, in the last two, three, four, five years. Um, yeah. And I want to, I want to drill down on a, on a question about empathy in regards to technologists. But first, I want to just remind everybody that 
you know, we've got about 25 minutes. You're welcome to send in questions. They're gonna be curated by the bookstore team. I'll be able to see those and ask Sherry, so, so please do. We wanna leave plenty of time for that. Um, but Sherry, something that has always struck me, I mean, I've um, obviously not worked in academe, but I've reported a lot in Silicon Valley and, and the kind of linear engineering mindset is something that has always struck me. I mean, my father was an engineer, like I know about this mindset and it's definitely got its uses, but there is a kind of a getting from point A to point B without, without any friction, uh, which reminds me of a story actually you told me, which kind of blew my mind about some colleagues that had developed an app so that people could get around campus yes. <laughs> to, to get, get from their offices to Starbucks without like meeting their ex-wife or the guy who'd gotten tenure when they did, you know, I mean, what? It's just, it's fascinating that the, the, the objects that we live our lives through are being designed still, not so much as it was 40 years ago, but still today by a rather small and linear group of, of thinkers, yeah? Well, I mean, now the issues, I, I wanna make sure people understand the wonderful story that you were telling. Yeah. That one of the demos that I went to at MIT uh, to illustrate the internet of things was, a, was an app where you could, it would chart a route, you, you, you would put in your coffee order and it would chart a route to get to your mochaccino, frappuccino, whatever, in which you would not need to pass like the department head who had been rude to you or an ex-girlfriend or an ex-wife or a, somebody who you didn't wanna see, somebody you owed money. I mean, you could tag everybody in your contact list for friction mm -hmm. and it would chart a route where you would never have to physically touch anybody. It treated everybody as an object and you could walk through your day, never, you know, it's like kind of, you know, Harry Potter's, you know, kind of, you know, like the, the map, you know, you could walk through Water, your day yeah, yeah. avoiding friction. And when I saw this, everybody loved this, this demo. Everybody, people thought this was the most brilliant demo. And I thought to myself, who says <laughs> that the good life is the life where we don't meet up, yeah. you know, with a little, a little friction. Well, yeah. apparently technology does. Apparently that is the ethos, you know, in engineer land, everything should have no friction. Everything should be friction free. And using that set of values to define our relationships with people is, comes very naturally to to people who grow up in the engineering culture but that's really a problem mm. because certainly what we face now in our country mm. is we face the imperative to have difficult conversations necessary conversations where we have empathy for each other where we have kindness towards each other where we have um, compassion for each other and our differences, but where we have friction. All right, so I have to, because you're bringing up political differences, I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna get personal. I'm gonna share the story of how you and I first, first met really. At <laughs> this is, hang on folks, because this, <laughs> this is a real, real bell ringer. Uh, we were at a technology conference together in person when we did that sort of thing a couple of years ago. I was moderating, you were speaking, Shoshana Zuboff was there. I mean, it was like total rock star lineup. Carl Rove was there. The guy from Cambridge Analytica was there. Oh God, that's right. The oh my, I mean, this was like, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, it was a big relations. Deal. <laughs> I was very excited to be riding around with all of you, you, Shoshana, Carl Rove, Cambridge Analytica guy, um, in this minibus, you know, for two days, being ferried to meetings and, and dinners and things. And I was noticing during the entire time, I was w actually watching Carl Rove because he, I thought, wow, who is this human being? I mean, I know and I'm horrified by his <laughs> politics, but who is this person? And you know, by golly, he had the best manners of almost anybody I've ever met. Now I'll say I'm on, you know, on the, the maybe the 
the, the far side of 50 and I'm Midwestern, so I'm susceptible to these things, but he was opening doors. He was pulling out chairs. He was, when nobody was looking, you know, getting pensioners their coffee. And this really struck me. And I remember walking into a dinner uh, and you and I were talking. And as we were walking to the door, there he was, Carl again, smoothly, easily opening the door. And I thought, I am so unwillingly charmed by this man. And I remember thinking, I wonder what Sherry thinks. And I started to look at you and you were already looking at me with that look on your face. And we both burst out laughing. And it was like, oh my God. It's like, this is such a bonding moment on so many levels. And we spoke about it later and I was just so struck. I mean, I was struck by your powers of observation, but also the ability to, to see, and this, here's empathy. I mean, my gosh, I'm guessing that you're no fan of Karl Rove, but there you were. And we were both having the same experience of being charmed by this man. So that seems like a good thing. You know, that seems like something we have maybe... Maybe if there was more of that in the political world at the moment, it would be a good thing. Discuss. What is there to say about this moment that, that, that would be illuminating? I mean, what isn't there to say actually, but. Maybe this moment, maybe those who are, maybe those who listen to that, this story can just understand it for mm. the story. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I have a lot to add. Although I, what, I, what I think is memorable about that story is, is and what I noticed that was, that, that, that really made a tremendous impression on me is, and I'm gonna quote you now because it's exactly as I experienced it. When nobody was looking, because mm -hmm. he couldn't have known that we were looking. No. When nobody, was looking, Carl Rove was being nice <laughs> to Ever. Wallflower, yeah. who being not, was being nice to people who were there working the tables. Mm -hmm. He was there being nice to the waitresses. He was there helping people pick things up if something fell. Yeah. And I remember thinking, nobody's looking. And uh, it, and, And really being able to make that disconnect mm. between yeah. the purposes he serves in the world of politics yeah. and the purposes he serves in his world of personal relationships. Yeah. And I think that it's very, very hard to do that, increasingly hard to do that. And I think that in order, I will say this about our future, that in order to continue to be able to talk to each other, we better start to be able to do that. Indeed. Well, you know, on that note, we have some questions coming through. There's actually one from a listener in Brazil. Um, you, your reach is global, of course. Um, he admires your work or she, not sure. Um, looking forward to reading your new book. Uh, would like you to talk more about empathy and this particular moment and, you know, amidst COVID, amidst the pandemic, amidst all the political polarization, is this going to change um, our ability to be empathic? And is it going to change our relationship with technology? And if so, how? Well, I, I, I don't want to say I'm optimistic because optimist, optimistic is a little strong. But I, I believe that we're at a moment that, um, uh, and I talk about this in the Empathy Diaries, that, that, that is liminal. It's a betwixt and between moment. It's a moment where rules are disappearing. We don't know. We don't know what we've been through. We don't know what we face. Norms, rule. I mean, we're, it's it's a time out of time. Mm -hmm. And in moments like this, things get shaken up. Mm -hmm. And that I think that as we come out of this, we're not going to believe anymore if somebody comes along and says, 
I have something to sell you. I have like a program for your computer that'll teach your kid on the screen and it, it'll be able to measure his or her uh, achievement, give you feedback. And, and what, what's more, it'll be able to give him the best teachers in the world. Sherry Turkle can teach him about memoir, you know, and you'll be, I think you'll say, you know what? I want my child to have mentorship and relationship. You keep your script, you know, my child needs a, fr a teacher who's a friend and who'll teach him or her to be with other people and who'll, who'll be there as a person for him. Mm. I don't think we're going to be so, you know, I think we're going to come to technology now saying, you know, I've had a lot of technology and I know what remote work is and I know what it's good for and I know what I miss. Mm -mm. And not so fast to give my kid like a fantastic program with the whole library on, you know, I, I, my, my, my child needs a mentor because one thing I'll say about, you know, the stories in my book and why I'm here today is that it's filled with mentors, mentors, mentors yeah. who, who talked to me, who believed in me, who formed relationships with me this didn't happen on screens. So I think that that's my true answer to this very wonderful, complex question that we, we're we ready, we need to be empathic because we need each other more than ever. Yeah. Let me ask you, I mean, talking about mentorship, I mean, one of your many mentors in the book was your husband, your former husband, Seymour Papere. Um, you write that he lived in a world where intellect was valued more highly than empathy. Um, he is one of many difficult men in this book. I'm sure, I'm sure very compelling as well. Um, I'm curious about that balance, um, you know, intellect versus empathy. I mean, we live in a world of experts. We live in a world that needs experts in a lot of ways. I mean, they've been sort of devalued in recent years. Maybe we need to revalue them a little bit, but but we also need empathy. Um, you know, I cover economics. There's a big question mark right now between math and what is human. Um, how do we strike that balance? How do you, how do you think about it? And, and how would you connect that back to your own personal journey that you write about in the book? I think right now the balance needs to shift back. The, the balance has shifted too much towards uh, engineering. Mm. And we need to come back. I mean, well, there are two things. I'm not talking about not not believing science. I mean, in, in, you know, if you're if you're talking in the realm of you know, vaccines, uh, building bridges, you know, I mean, uh, how to handle a a pandemic. Uh, I, I'm not talking about anti-science or anti-vaxxer movements. But in terms of um, coming out of uh, kind of what the culture needs to where we need a recalibration uh, in thinking, for example, about education. Mm. Uh, you're mm. gonna have a generation of children who, who really ha have not just missed their math, mm. they've, they've missed experiences of, of, of connection mm. and of people caring about them and and have had terrible isolation yeah and have been hungry and have had the experience also of being hungry and not necessarily feeling that the country cared uh there's been a very ambivalent reaction mm -hmm. as we're seeing now about oh really uh, you know tremendous poverty i mean the, the, our country's um relationship to inequality of income is kind of like amazingly um, callous. I mean, I remember, you know, and we've seen things. I mean, this is why I also think it's kind of a moment of, in the, in the book I talk about, you know, moments of revelation where you see things afresh. I mean, I remember the first time over the summer that I watched the food lines in Texas of just cars in big stadiums lining up to get a week, of, you know, a, a, ba a bag or a couple of a box of a week's worth of food, people in beautiful cars who had never been on a food line. 
I mean, we've seen things in terms of race and in terms of hunger that I, I think we need to, you know, really begin to see again and see fresh and more empathically and compassionately. Um, and I, I'm hoping that this shock to our system, you know, allows us to, you know, have that kind of uh, new way of looking at each other. And I think we see some signs that that's happening. You know, I hope so. Although I also feel that in some ways technology has allowed us to remain even more siloed because there are all of us that are doing what we're doing right now and those of us who aren't, but we, we know that. Let me just, I wanna make sure um, I, you have another um, couple of minutes reading that I'd love you to be able to give, but I wanna ask one more question before that. We have a really interesting question from Rosa Alleman. Toni Morrison once said that all utopias are defined by those who are excluded from it. Thinking about empathy in tech, why do you think that tech engineering spaces insist on building utopias that empower such limited perspectives, straight, white, male, and resist true diversity? Is technology primarily engineered from a conscious or unconscious fear-based exclusive mentality as a tool for control? Whew. Yes. <laughs> I was gonna say we need another hour, but no, we just need one word, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, uh, uh, um, yeah, I, I think it doesn't, I mean, the question is who's controlling the technology? I mean, mm -hmm. this is, but I think that, you know, um, this digital technology began, I mean, one of the incredible things about this technology is I'm old enough to remember when I first studied it in the second self mm -hmm. in the uh, late seventies, going to California, going to hippie, communes and all the these incredible left-wing San Francisco people were figuring out how you were going to use things that kind of had a Facebooky feeling to yeah. form you know communes and have people join together to share food and share resources and start you know political movements for the people and so uh the, the dreams, the utopian dreams that this started out with mm. could not survive in a business model. Mm. In the well, business model where you, in order to make money, oh, I know, you know we, we need to scrape people's data and sell yeah. their data. I mean, we, we, we really just can't do this by sharing people's, you know, by people kind of sharing information in their baby pictures. We need to, you know, here's how we can make money out of this. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what, what's at war here is, is, is our, um, is, are we going to uh, reassert certain kinds of human values over this technology? And one of my, you know, one of the points I make in, you know, everything I write and every time I speak is, is, is just, is to say, you know, every author is allowed to say, What's their favorite sentence? What's their favorite tagline? What's their favorite hashtag? And I, I think I shared with Ron that mine is something I wrote for a TED talk, which was, um, we think the internet is all, we, we, the reason we think the internet is all grown up is because we grew up with the internet. Mm. So we think the, we grew up with the internet, so we think the internet is all grown up. Mm. That's the line. We think the internet is all, we grew up with the internet, so we think the internet is all grown up, which makes us say things, stupid things like the horse is out of the barn, it's too late to change anything. But I love this horse is out of the barn thing. If one more person, I mean, everybody's always telling me it's too late to change anything, the horse is out of the barn. It, it's only our misperception that the internet is in its maturity because we were babies when it started yeah. and now we're middle-aged, so it's all grown up, we're all grown up. It's a, it's in its, it's, you know, it's in its, it's not even in its adolescence. It's just starting. Mm. So just because Facebook seems like a mature company, it's, it's just starting. It's a just mm. starting company. Google is a just starting company. We have to start to treat this technology as, as something that now it is time for us to say, time to sculpt and change it. When I was arguing, some of Ron was 
generously saying that I think it's true that I was making some of these points about privacy, about scraping information, about the kind of addictive properties of the internet, the kind of way in which if you divide your attention, you end up doing nothing correctly. Mm -hmm. And people would say, oh, no, 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 <laughs> just leave me alone. You know, <laughs> kind of, well, now these are like truisms. We all know it. We have to face it. It's, it's, it's not like I'll worry about it tomorrow. We have to worry about it today because our, our kids can't think. And well, it's time to face these things and not, not wish them away because now we have a, a new generation and the problems that they face are more difficult than ever. And we have to get the technology to serve our human purposes. So I, I think we're actually, I think we're better prepared to take this seriously now because we are no longer saying, well, I don't want to think about this. I'll think about it tomorrow. Uh, mm. We know that, that, that the internet has changed the course of history. It's changed the course of elections. It has tremendous power to create, you know, spread disinformation. Uh, these things now are, um, are banal things to say. It's almost like, you know, if you say them, people say, well, when are you going to get to some interesting, mm. give me some content. Mm. Uh, but now it's time for us to act on these things as now everybody knows them and we all agree on them. And but we can't just say, well, that's the way it is. That's how the internet works. Uh, well, it's a, it's a great, it's a great point. Um, and you, you know, you really started that conversation. You were very much alone when you did. Um, you are used to being alone. You are used to being the outsider. That's a story that you tell in your book. And I want to invite you just in the few minutes that we have left to do a second reading. Um, you said that you had um, chosen a-, a uh, Yeah, I, I, I'm going to end up, but it's not a political reading. I wonder if, yeah. um, is that no, okay? It's not, or? I think it's okay. I think we should bring this back to your memoir and your experience. Okay, I, I, I'm going to, but I, I just wanted to say about the, about the aloneness. Um, I think that uh, my, because I was so used to being alone, mm. that sort of helped me. It was a sort of superpower mm, mm. in that way. And I'm, I'm gonna describe uh, a, a scene from when I got to Radcliffe that um, in which, which shows my isolation. Mm. And I, I was telling Rana that this scene, which is so raw, made it back and in and out of the book 16 times because it was so raw mm. and I wasn't sure I wanted to share it, but I did because I think it, um, this story, this book is also a story of growing up mm. and about being brave as you grow up and about how to develop empathy. And this was a very important moment for me in the development of empathy. So I guess it is a good place to end. Um, at Radcliffe, I wanted to feel a part, but there were moments that made me aware of how much I was seen as an outsider. In spring of freshman year, there was a series of thefts in Holmes Hall that was my freshman dorm. Someone was stealing small bills anything that was left in sight, not locked up. There was an investigation, an all dorm meeting. The house masters explained that the person who was doing this needed help. She should come to them and seek help. We were told that the mystery of who was stealing the money was never solved, but I was shocked to overhear in a lunch conversation, a hint that several people thought it was me. I didn't have close friends, but why would people see me as a thief? I approached Lynn, a tall, studious blonde, and I asked her this question point blank. I trusted her. Like me, she was quiet, but unlike me, she had a roommate with whom she was close, so she never seemed isolated. Lynn was forthright. In Holmes Hall, you needed coins for the payphone and the Coke machine. Lynn said that I was the person who most often asked other people for change. I thought that might be right. When I was lonely, asking for change was a way to have a quick visit. I could see that it might have been irritating, unwelcome, and perhaps I did it more than I thought. 
I waited for more evidence of my being a criminal. There was none. Lynn described the group thinking. I was someone who was so isolated that she needed excuses to come into other girls' rooms to feel a part of things. Perhaps I would take their stuff as another way to feel connected. My eyes smarted. Lynn said she had no reason to think I'd ever stolen anything, but she thought I should know how, was how I was coming off. I didn't sputter or defend myself. I was able to put myself in the place of all those girls in the middle of their conversations when I came looking for change. I could imagine their annoyance and I could put myself in Lynn's place. She was brave. I thanked her. Lynn said she would have been happy to talk if I had just knocked on her door and asked to chat. I told her I would have been afraid to do that because she seemed so close with her roommate and I knew she had a famous dad. I thought her life must be so difficult from mine. She shrugged. We started to talk. Lynn taught me something about empathy. It's not just listening. She stayed with me. She made sure I took something positive from our conversation. I talked about learning from review books in high school and how that made me feel I hadn't really ever learned the real thing. I think she talked about the ups and downs of growing up with a well-known parent. I didn't talk about Sherry Zimmerman or my adoption. I didn't begin a new life in the sunlight but I'd taken a risk in reaching out to another person and she hadn't let me down. I knew I would try again. I realized how much I wanted to talk to other people. I wanted to hear their stories. I had heard too little of life. Sherry, um, you are a brave woman. This is a brave book. Um, I am not going to give away the mystery about your father um, or the ending, which is very, very much worth getting to. But I encourage everybody to read the book. Um, it's been just an absolute pleasure to be here with you tonight. And I wish you all the best as you continue with your tour for this instant classic, Thank says you. the New York Times. And watch out for the lunch with the FT. I have to get a plug in for us too in the next couple of weeks. So great to be with you. Thank you both for uh, this conversation. Thanks so much for, for taking time out of your evenings. Thank you all of you for joining us. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and Cambridge Mass, have a, have a good evening. Stay safe, stay well. And thanks again. Have a good evening, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks.